Hello, I'm Dori Nando. You can catch up with all the fun on the Cosmopolitan Mix and on all our shows via podcast. Just go to my Joy Online podcast and search for your favorite show and relive those moments all over again. Only on Joy 99.7 FM, radio for discerning listeners. Super Hits Radio, radio. Joy 99.7. Good morning and welcome. This is the AM News here on the AM Show. Now, in our first story, there's been mixed reactions in various assemblies after the release of the list of Metropolitan, Municipal and District Chief Executive nominees. While some are kicking against the President's nominees, others are welcoming the appointments with a call on constituents and party supporters to accept and confirm the appointees during the Assembly elections. For example, the nomination of Kennedy Kankam as MCE for Asokori Mampong in the Ashanti region is receiving strong contention from a section of residents. Some who spoke to Joyce News say they are surprised at the president's nomination. They say that the former MP for Nshaisu is not known in the area and might not understand the dynamics of the people and their needs. Prince Apia has more in this report. The MMDC nominations in Ashanti region has seen new faces like Maxwell Ufusum Boache for Swami, Kennedy Kankan for Asakori Mampo Municipal Assembly, and Sampai as the chief executive for the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly. There has been mixed reactions from across the region. Residents of the Asakori Municipal Assembly, for instance, were expectant of the renomination of Mr. Akunia Sajima. Uh, in fact, all of us are happy. Because uh, we have a joint working relationship, good working relationship with him. Coupled with this uh, human relationship and then he also knows the work. He knows the work. And then the, these two years that he came to office, uh, he did his best. As a newly created municipality, uh, he was fantastic. I'm happy the president has seen his good works and has re-nominated him. The Asakari Mampo Municipal Assembly is one of the interesting municipal assemblies in Ashanti region. Again, it is one of the newest because it was created in 2013 after the 2012 elections. The first municipal chief executive was Nu Hamidan for the NDC. Then Ali Duseidu took over when the MPP came to power. The expectation in this particular nominations was that he will be retained. But unfortunately, Mr. Kennedy can come. Fortunately for him, uh, his name has been mentioned. But the residents here and the assembly are not really happy about the turn of events. We have wanted somebody who is a resident of this municipality, who is more abrasive our situation. But Kennedy, uh, a former MP for Nshia, so I don't think uh, uh, for now uh, my people will be that much enthused about his appointment. MC, you know, as a was in the power way, but fine cura. Your pernosa and yes, idea, some blemess or no more moon to mano. So far as uh, someone is new to you, doesn't mean that the person don't have a potential. Can it can come as a new name, but we are all looking for someone that will help us to develop our communities. No, 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 because um, Kennedy can come's name never cropped up. It never popped up. It came as a surprise to some of us. At least the president could have nominated from the aspirant. Kennedy Kankam Kankam is not from this constituency. He doesn't know how we have really suffered to retain the party in power 2020. So coming to Asawasi constituency, how will he know the grassroots? How will he know the party faithful? So at any time they come for help, he can help them. But if the nomination could have come from the aspirant, at least they are our brothers. We quarrel, we fight, but as uh, we are all bound within the Zongo community, we know each other. From Enshayesu, it's Oforukrum, before even as a Mampo. As a former MP, if he is interested in this kind of position, they should have given him Enshayesu, but not as a Mampo municipality. As a Mampo municipality, sorry to say, it's bigger than him. We are the Zongo people, we understand ourselves. But bringing him, Kennedy can come from Enshayesu to as a Mampo, I'm really hurt, I'm really hurt, frankly speaking. I'm not happy with this decision. But as the saying goes, they said when two brothers suffer, uh, fight to kill themselves, a stranger will inherit their father's position. So this should serve as a lesson to all those who are coming to, who, who are coming to contest in the near future in some of these positions. My name is Prince Apia reporting from Asquare Mampong. He was charged with rape, incest and threat of death. He had sex with his daughter and produced two children, a boy and a girl, 
from the unholy wedlock. The cards asked, how do these children call you, father or grandfather? Well, the Jassican District Circuit Court in the Oti region has sentenced 64-year-old farmer Gideon Hamenu to 10 years in prison and hard labor for incest and rape and threat of death. The 30-year-old victim says she is relieved after opening up on the matter. She's been speaking to our correspondent, Peter Senu. Gideon Hamenu is a 64-year-old farmer at Bori Cherahini in the Jessican Police District. According to the facts before the court, Gideon first forcibly had sex with her daughter and got her pregnant in 2018. Others followed. He also threatened her with death if she ever told anyone about the ungodly act. It is his third attempt still to force her daughter for sex, which she refused, that got Gideon in troubled waters. He then started assaulting her and making other unfounded allegations against her. We are told Gideon had unstable marriage with the victim's mother, so asked her to come and stay with him. The now 30-year-old daughter has been speaking to Joy News. <laughs> We lived and worked on a man's farm, and in the night my dad would force my door open. He did that several nights, but when I complain, he does not say anything. One of the nights, he forced and had sex with me. After I gave birth, our landlord asked of the father of the child, and my dad became aggressive and violent. He made us relocate to Jessica. The same thing happened at Jessica, and we relocated to Buri, Cherahini. Anytime he does that, he made us relocate because of embarrassment. He wanted to do the same at Buri, and I resisted. I confided in one elderly man, and my father got offended and started assaulting me. He even slapped me one down because I had asked him to intervene. He threatened to kill him or me. It was at this time the police had to come in. I am now relieved after I open up. I am now a free person. The Jessican Circuit Court also asked the police to hand over the victim to the social welfare unit in the district and also use the proceeds from his cocoa farm for the upkeep of the victim and the children. Emilia Gbedua is the district director for social welfare in the Jessican district. She has been telling Joy News how they intend to let the victim settle in. I can say for every year we've been having those cases. In fact, this year, this is the second one we are experiencing. So I think we need to do more sensitization and then let people come out because we know if some of them do ha happen, but then they don't talk about it because of the stigma attached to it. So we have to encourage them to come out anytime this, if these cases happen or anytime anyone experiences this. Her community where the incident happened, she's been uh, asked to leave. So we, together with the relevant stakeholders, the police, assembly men, and other few people, will go to the community to see the chiefs and elders and sit with them, explain things to them. And then they will have to give her some time to live. Since she says she has a farm and other things there, so she will need to take care of those things first. Then we'll have to meet with her one on one, give her um, counseling. She's going through a lot of psychological trauma now. She needs to be talked to, she needs someone to confide in. So we'll be there for her all the way and see her through. Then we'll have to know what her plans are. If she wants to relocate, where she will be, what work she will be doing, so that she can take care of the, herself and the children, especially the children. They are our prime aim right now. So we'll be with her through and see how we can help her take care of the children and herself. Peter Senu for Joy News. From a street child, sorry, to a politician, this is the story of Member of Parliament for Medina, Francis Xavier Sosu, who was among the lots that were catered for many years at the Village of Hope. Over the years, the organization made up of three schools, a hospital, and an orphanage has provided shelter for many children who hitherto had no hope of a bright future. 
at the organization's 25th anniversary celebration, many people like Mr. Sosu shared their stories to encourage the children who are still at the center. Judith Awachitando was at the ceremony and sends this report. I say it proudly wherever I find myself that Village of Hope is the reason why I am where I am today. And I'm proud of Village of Hope and I'll always be proud of Village of Hope. That is Francis Xavier Sosu, recounting his days at the Village of Hope in Gomua Fete. He is among many other children who were rescued from the streets and given a new life at the organization. My mother was a slave girl because she was what we call a vojushi or a trokoshi. She escaped from the voodoo shrine uh, as a teenager and got married to my dad and uh, both of them gave birth to six of us. I being the third born, um, I had to just struggle my way to be able to make it. I used to sleep at the Malata market um, and I would go there, sleep there and still go to school the following day. So Village of Hope came in at the senior high school. So at the senior high school, apart from the first admission fee I paid, I was unable to pay for any more school fees for all the three years I was there. So they awarded me a full scholarship to go to school. The Village of Hope has been home for many abandoned, homeless and vulnerable children since its establishment in 1996. For many years, it has offered these children a roof over their heads, quality education and a renewed hope of a brighter future. Solomon Abriya Bois was a beneficiary of the services provided at the institution. Today, He's the only craniofacial surgeon in all of West Africa. It all started, um, let me say, from 1997, when my mother died. I was then in the medical school, um, second year. And um, when that happened, I needed to take care of all my sisters and take care of myself as well. So um, it was actually a struggle. And uh, because of that, I needed to um, I actually failed and was repeated um, during that class. Life was still very, very difficult for me in those days. And um, um, my third year, I was repeated again. The Village of Hope um, paid my school fees from 2001 till I completed medical school. Village of Hope is 25 years now and currently houses over a thousand rescued children. Fred Asari is group managing director. Our vision is to establish a world-class institution that provides the best of care for needy people, especially children. And so we just don't want to provide any care. We want to provide the best. We want to provide care comparable to the care provided for needy people, especially needy children, all over the world. If I lose all things I may possess, I know that I still have G. An anniversary ceremony was organized in appreciation of the organization's achievements. Chief of Gomua Fete, Nana Abata II, who graced the occasion, expressed his continued support for the organization. In my capacity as the Fete Mahin and, the, and with assistance from Nana Anum, I want to assure the sponsors and management of Village of Hope of our continued support, which was first started by my predecessor, Nana Bore Abata II. Village of Hope has represented hope for many children like Francis Xavier who have grown to become useful to society and they are hoping to put many more smiles on the faces of children who have lost hope. Judith Awachitando, Joy News. Such a heartwarming story of hope there. And let's move on and talk about the patrons of the Echobank Joy News Habitat Fair. Um, who were at the second mini, mini clinic and were treated to huge discounts on various housing products and services. Manuel Kranting, who was at the West Hills Mall, reports many of the patrons were satisfied by the office on display.
The two-day mini-clinic, which is the second in a series of three ahead of the main Join News Ecobank Habitat Fair in October, attracted scores of patrons who were in search of answers to the question of whether to buy or to build that dream home. Various exhibitors pitched camp at the West Hills Mall with varied options on display. Aside that, we have three and four bedroom houses that we are selling within our gated estate located at Katamanso of the Adenta Dodowa Road. We also have UPVC windows, doors and accessories here. Um, Fairnet has been in existence since 1974, which is about 47 years old. And the only wood manufacturing company in Ghana as of now. Uh, we can boast of quality doors, woods, woods that are properly dried to the lowest temperature. Uh, they moisture content. Our doors are made of galvanized steel, okay. solid galvanized steel doors, yeah. What we call glazing. We have value streets, we've introduced gates as part of um, our lines, and most recently, our pergola and then very wonderful kitchens. It comprises of four components. We have the aluminum, the zinc, the magnesium, and the silicon. All these components come together to aid the product to perform better. For private individuals who wanted their own homes, this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I have seen these people, Bambi Smart Home, and their things are quality. I have their lights, when you put it on your phone, you can switch your light on phone and put it off on your phone. And even you can talk and the light will go off or come on. And you can talk, the blender will start working or go off. So you are buying? Yes, I'm buying. I'm, I'm about to pay it before you call. Make the first step. Put the first step uh, and make the first step and do the analysis for themselves and see how, whether it's good for them to build based on your income, whether it's to build or to buy. But they were not alone. There were other building consultants and architects who are taking time off their busy schedules to hunt for new housing products and services at the clinic. It's, I'm an architect. Um, some of these exposures are very good. You come around and you see different um, and the variety of um, things, products that we have in stock. Um, and then that better also informs you as to whatever recommendations you can also make to clients when, when they, they, they come to you. Yes. Uh, I'm an engineer myself, so I decided to pass by to see what is being offered, especially in the area of lands and, and other accessories relating to the industry, the building industry. That's why I'm here, and I've been impressed. But uh, I recommend that if you are planning or if you even intend to do, just pass by. There are offers that might meet your need. For many of the exhibitors who set up at the clinic, it had been a good time to make great sales. All of yes, this money. It's, it's a good opportunity for Joy News, and I think it's, it's it, this opportunity. We, we are just making good advantage. We are taking good advantage of it. Yes, so we are making some sales. Yes, thanks to Joy News, of course. Yes. And that's it for the AM News. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And the AM show continues with Israel Laye and myself. Don't go anywhere. Hi, this is Lexus Bill, host of Drive Time on Joy 99.7 FM. Listen, you don't have to worry if you miss Drive Time or personality profile. It's going to be live on our podcast page. Just log on to www.myjoyonline.com forward slash podcast you can listen to drive time personality profile and any other of your favorite shows on joy fm on that page you don't have to miss a show at all joy 99.7 fm radio for discerning listeners all right good morning once again and it's time for the news review and uh, we have a very fat daily graphic oh god is that Here we, go. we need time mm. yeah just take the whole review then. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Go I'm ahead. I'm going to take the whole review. It's, it's a lot going on this morning. So. Yeah. Okay. So the top story on the front page, the main story on the front page, key MMDC is dropped. Ashanti has highest 43 northeast, a half foot six each. And it's about the release of the list of MMDCs and uh, the issues that have come up. Okay. So some current chief executives of... Metropolitan, municipal, and district assemblies will not be returning to their roles following the release of nominees for the various MMDAs in the 
country. So key among the casualties in the chief executives of the Accra Metropolitan Assembly AMA, Mohamed Nia Jesua, the term of Metropolitan Assembly, uh, Felix Mensa Nianang La, the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly, Ose SCB Enchi, the Cape Coast Metropolitan Assembly, Anthony J. A. Kings, and the Tamale Metropolitan Assembly, Mr. Idrisu Musa Superior. So we'll be, we'll be having a lot more uh, conversations about this. In fact, the AM show will be focusing on that. So do stay tuned in. Going to page five, gunmen released 10 Nigerian students. Janta defies ECOWAS pressure on Conde's release. I'll read you a bit of the story. So the military says, uh, detained ex-president Alpha Conde will not be allowed to leave Guinea after the coup, defying regional pressure. Guinea's military leaders say they will not let deposed President Alpha Conde seek exile after regional mediators attempted to mount pressure to secure his release following a coup earlier this month. The statement came after the West African regional bloc, known as ECOWAS, met Colonel Mamadi Dumboya in Conakry. And that meeting was attended by President Kofuado and Alassane Ouattara. And there are many who are saying Alassane Ouattara shouldn't have been part of that conversation because he himself changed his constitution, the country's constitution, to give himself a third term. So, yeah. Australia defends role in security pact Tim Pakayo to run for president. So that Philippine boxing star Manny Pakayo says he will run for president in next year's elections in the Philippines. Moving on. We go to page 16. Man 42 busted with 656 ATM cards. Yes, 656 Why? What's he doing ATM with them? Cards. Okay, certainly must have to do with fraud or something. Oh my God. So the National Intelligence Bureau, NIB, has busted a 42 year old man with 656 ATM cards connected to nine banks operating in Ghana and Nigeria. Bashir Musa Aminu, who claims to be a, a Nigerian, but holds a Nigerian passport, concealed the cards in a black plastic bag containing cola nuts bound for Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. He was busted at the Kutska International Airport on September 12th when I was going through departure formalities on route to Dubai. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, wow. I mean, it must certainly have to do with some fraud of and so on. I mean, why, why else would you have 656 ATM cards? ATM cards. So... They talk about ATM fraud has been a major challenge for the financial sector. According to BOG, a BOG fraud report, ATM POS related fraud accounted for 32.2% of to total fraud loss in the banking sector. Wow. All right. President addresses UN General Assembly Wednesday. So the president is, uh, is in uh, New York for the UN General New York, Assembly. New York, New yeah. York. Then on page 17, some more about the. Uh, um, MMDC's nom nominations, 38 females nominated for MMDC positions. But we're looking at 260 in all, and 38 females. I'm thinking that that's quite, you know, not, not enough women in there. Wondering why, though. Mm -hmm. Tsunami in Bono region as president dominates MMDCs. Okay, so the people who are unhappy, there's quiet over the, the nominations. Approve MNDC nominees, not more boards, edges, assembly members. And there's a story of uh, Ama Benyuado mm. passing. Mm. Yeah, it's on page 19. Ama, Ama Benyuado is dead. She was embodiment of courage. Mahama, yeah. Former President Mahama tweeted, uh, posted a tweet about her demise. Political will needed to make local government work. That's um, Opong Fosu. And then moving on regional, on the regional page, CAT expands dialysis capacity from 6 to 30. Okay, that's very good. And uh, we move to page 29. Justice School Teachers Presby University College Board and allow members to seek medical help. Pastor tells churches. There are quite a few... Um, adverts in the daily graphic, but preach against get rich quick syndrome. Vice President urges religious leaders. Three teaching hospitals get new boards. 
COVID-19 cases decline. Yes, it's true. It's on page uh, 49. The cases are declining, but we're still seeing a number of deaths being recorded, and that's worrying. So something we need to look at. In the center spread, there's a new feature, a news feature, Black Hole of Graduate Unemployment, Sustainable Solution in Sight. That's a question being asked, and it shows, uh, has a photograph of uh, thousands of people at the Airwalk Stadium for the Ghana Armed Forces recruitment screening. And they're sitting on it on the floor. There's so many of them. Wow. Okay. Let's move on to some other stories. For now, it's just um, at first I see. Now, first batch of Germany's vaccines arrive. And Gold opens new service stations at Nkrumah Circle and Keta. And uh, Moving on, more adverts. Then we go to page 56. Two week ultimatum for patient lagoon encroaches. So, a joint team from the La, La Dadi Kotupong and Lejokuku Municipal Assemblies have served notices to encroaches along the patient lagoon to vacate the area. On education, drabbing, SHS, ST, Sebastian for Interschool Fine Debate Final. Ghana Library, UNICEF Launch Initiative for Youth. Ghana Malta to deeping ties. That's the High Commissioner saying that. And um, some more adverts. Then we'll go on to yet another story. Okay, so this. Uh, there's a story here, SNIT report on Lighthouse case. I think this is uh, something put out by the Social Security and National Insurance Trust on the, the issue with the pastors that they had. At Lighthouse, yeah. yeah. Now, Santahini task MIIF to seek welfare of mining communities. Mm. That's the Minerals Income Investment Fund, MIF. It says revenue generated from mining resources must be used for intended, its intended purposes, such as the construction of good roads and the provision of social amenities for the people. Republic Bank introduces new mortgage products. And on page 71, Global Echo Capacity Exchange appoints Phil Gabra as president. Prudential Bank donates vehicle to reward teachers. ICGC's charismatic intervention. That's an opinion piece on page 75. In graphic sports, Asantini advises minister to improve sports. And boxing, Kwe fights Ajima, October 9. Black Stars, get another cup of Milo? <laughs> That's a question there. And on the back page, Hearts eliminate C.I. Oh, Kamsa. God, God, God. So a crowd of folk. Um, okay, there's something, that part is not clear. The CAF Champions pro booked. They had a, probably, a match yesterday. Booked, yeah. Booked the CAF Champions League campaign to a blistering start. Booked. Took. Okay, so it's not very clear Took. what's there. Took. It's, it's, um. I think it's The print didn't come out. No, there's an ED there. Okay, so the CAF Champions League campaign to a blistering start with an emphatic 2 0 win over Guinean side. CI Kamsa at the Accra Stadium yesterday. A late strike by substitutes Kofi Koji and Salim Adams in the 83rd and 93rd minute respectively gave the Accra to focus a 2 0 win to ensure their progression to the next stage of the competition. All right. That's it for the graphic. That's it for the graphic. All right, well, let's move on to the Daily Guide this morning. And on the front page of the Daily Guide, MCE is named a missed drama. But of course, there was always going to be drama, drama. And we'll have a, a more detailed conversation about that later on in the show. Nana in New York for UN meeting. And pregnant woman kidnapped in Takwadu. Okay, so um, tomorrow's Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Day. So it's supposed to be a holiday. So Israel will be working and I'll be home. Um, but um, we know that you'll be here with us regardless. Let me just do some of Why the other stories. Because it's a holiday. <laughs> um, some of the other stories. Yeah, but why will you be home? Because it's a holiday. 
So if it's holy, why, why will I come to work if you're... Because you're the, the leader of the team. You're the boss. You're the <laughs> legend. You're the one that we all look up to. You're the one who sacrifices your sleep so that the rest of your team can rest. That's why we love you and we're so grateful to you for, for, for you know, offering the sacrifice of your time so that all of us can you know, sleep in. It's fantastic. Israel is absolutely amazing, I must say. Okay, <laughs> you are on TV with your glasses falling off. Oh, boy. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, let me continue with the stories in the Daily Guide. Um, MC is named amidst drama. Some international stories, UK fertilizer shortage will send food prices shooting up. So obviously this fertilizer shortage issue, um, it's not just Ghana, it's happening in the United Kingdom as well. Um, so fertilizers are made using natural gas, supplies of which have dwindled because of high demand for electricity production. That's very interesting. New Johannesburg mayor killed in car crash. Oh, gosh. So South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa has paid tribute to the new mayor of Johannesburg following his death in a car crash at age, age, age 46. He had been campaigning, and the details are sketchy, um, but local media have shown images of the front of a car badly smashed up. He, was, he only became mayor on the 10th of August. Um, because his predecessor had died from COVID complications. It's really, really sad. May his soul rest in peace. Yeah. Stay home, female Kabul government workers told. Um, Boxer Mani Pakayo to run for Philippines president. Interesting. How to manage multiple businesses. That's why Market Champong also in the Daily Guide. Pregnant woman kidnapped in Takrade. So the husband of a missing, heavily pregnant woman says he has received calls from someone suspected to have kidnapped his wife demanding ransom. Gosh, ex-Kumasi mayor is new NSS boss. Um, NDC's Amar Benyuado, may her soul rest in peace, is dead. Seized Rosewood donated to build National Cathedral. And we knew that was going to happen, so. Um, rogue website operator arrested for WIAC papers leak. I had wanted to commit suicide. Gospel act Millicent Yankee talks about difficult days. Kewa scolds unsympathetic Nisaka Brown over Ajete failure comment. Oh gosh. So music producer Kewa has described as unfortunate statement by the actor Nisaka Brown that his senior colleague Sam Ajete Few is a failure. They are very unfortunate. Unfortunate. Um, Two Face is talking to his wife and saying, I know I'm not without mistakes. Ah, you don't say. He's, received, he's released a loved up photo with his wife, Annie Dibia, on his Instagram page. Um, and he says, I know I'm not without mistakes, neither am I perfect, but we keep learning and working and striving to become the best version of ourselves. It is well. Hmm. Okay. Wendy Williams reportedly in the hospital for a mental health check. That's it for um, entertainment. Access Bank launches business startup challenge. Um, Presidents reappoints SHC boss. Um, banker 35 arrested for defiling girl 14. Ashimoto School's teacher commits suicide. A 48-year-old physics teacher at Ashimoto School has allegedly committed suicide. The body of Clifford Nkrumah was found hanging on his ceiling in his room at Ashimoto last Thursday. May his soul rest in peace. Okay. Um, okay, other stories... Um, GTA board urged to create one million jobs. I love the tourism industry, you know, and the ministers. Very ambitious, very hopeful, very passionate. Absolutely love that. 2021 mental reality show ready to roll. Comerica Homecoming, oh God. Slated for December 23rd. Kotoko, which is the only Ghanaian team that matters. Hire new coach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maka, maka. TV3 goes home in style. Um, and TV by TV3, we mean Godfrey Diabois, former Kotoko captain, um, widely known as TV3, was laid to rest on Saturday in a dignified manner. May his soul rest in peace. Otunfo extols minister. Um, and this is the minister for youth and sports, Mustafa. Papers are blurry today, eh? Yeah. Um, so he says that he's done a really good job and um, it's changing the face of sports. 
Okay, so that's it. That's about it. That's it for the daily guide. Okay. Hmm? So let me bring you the daily statement then. It says, uh, President Kufuado attend 76th session of UN General Assembly and 128 MMDCs retained. Fred Sampine for KMA, Elizabeth Saki for AMA, and um, MPP slams NDC over falsehood against 2020 elections. Then uh, we get into the page, the stories uh, it's themselves. Your good works as NSS and your sports ministry job, and that's a story was also in the finder. And 2021 YCYC announces new dates for cancelled papers. Move, um, moving on to page six. Ghana rates in over $6.5 billion in oil revenue in 10 years. And the question will be, so what have we got to show for it? Armed robber shot dead at Akin Abomoso. And NLA to partner Ivorian counterpart to increase revenue. Then we go to page 11. Bisakede returns with a new party and then Yard. Nice. Yard. 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 Yeah. Like Yardy Yard. Yeah. Okay, I haven't heard it, have you? No, I haven't. Okay. Well, maybe we can um, listen to it um, after the review. Okay. Um, echo. Bisakede Yard. Yard. Apparently, that's what it's called. Akta Koshe is dead. So that story also came over the weekend. And Shatawale is saying something in the corner there. Shatawale says, I supported three music awards with 100,000 Ghana CDs. Oh, okay. I, I saw that interview. I think IB did it on Friday. He supported them 100,000. Yeah, he said he gave them 100,000 CDs. For real? Yeah, that's what he said. Should we call him? <laughs> yes, we should. <laughs> Florence Obinim, I am not moved by social media trolls. And then let's get to the back page. Jimmy Greaves, ex-England and Tottenham striker dies, aged 81. And Manny Pacquiao, boxing star to run for Philippines president. Interesting. Okay, so let me do the find out quickly. Um, Stephen and team congratulates new MMDC nominees. The list is out. That story is on the front page of every newspaper um, this morning. Interior Minister is calling for humanitarian structures for women. Um, so Ambrose Derry has called for a humanitarian structure that places women's needs, rights and empowerment at its heart to ensure gender equality. Now, that kind of sounds like what the, gender, the Ministry for Gender and Social Welfare should be doing. Um, do we really need another structure for that, if, if that ministry was doing their job as well as they could be? Uh, I don't know. Okay, just saying. Um, Samson's take. IGP Akufu Damparis Fidelity to Law. And that's by Samson Ladia. You definitely want to read it, because Samson is... Absolutely fantastic. Good morning, Samson, if you're watching us. You know we love you. Uh, middle page of the finder. Um, U.S. opens a $100,000 public health center in Ashanti region. Okay. Auntie Stephanie has been doing a lot since she got here. Um, she said that as part of U.S. support for Ghana's public health system and COVID-19 response, it has established a public health emergency operations center in the Ashanti region. That's very nice. Republic Bank reduces interest costs. Okay, uh, Reginald Daniel Lai, now Goyle Board Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Lai. Are you related? No. Okay. Um, rescheduled physics business management paper to be written on October 1st and 7th. EPA UNDP commits ambitious climate action towards green recovery. Piak Tors Volta engages citizens and inspects oil money projects. Africa's COVID-19 cases surpass 8.14 million. That's gone to Africa CDC. That's very, very interesting. Um, da, 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 so South Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, and Ethiopia are among the countries with the most cases on the continent. And in terms of the caseload, Southern Africa is the most affected region, followed by the northern and eastern parts of the continent, while Central Africa is the least affected region in the continent, according to Africa CDC. So that's it. CAF Champions, oh, CAF Champions League. Hats of folks set up clash with WAC of Morocco after beating CI Kamsa. I must say congratulations to Hats of Folk. Well done. Um, Thank you. Obviously, you'll be making Ghana proud. So. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Right now, as we speak, it's the only club that matters. 
Baba Yara, that's why you are working alone tomorrow, so it's fine. Baba Yara Sports Stadium ready for use, that's according to Sports Minister. Continue your good works at the Youth and Sports Ministry, Utu to Mustafa Yusuf. UCC lecture appointed Asante Kotoko head coach. And um, that's it for the finder. Do you have any more? No. No. Okay. Well, I have the Daily Dispatch, and I think um, you can do the Economy Times maybe, because I think we have a little bit of time. Let me get into Daily Dispatch. Um, interesting story. Kwabna Dufour's campaign team for NDC 2024 slots out. Very interesting there. Um, focus on the Buzia era in Ghanaian politics, as according to, um, okay, by Dr. Obeda Samwa. Ken Dapa on general perspectives and trends of national security in Ghana. That's on page three. Improving timing estimates in cross-junction situations. And that has to do with road safety and all the accidents that happen at junctions um, because of, of how we gauge the, the timing of cars and all of that. So very, very important. Good song plus big pocket equals success in the music industry. Kofi Kenata is speaking, of course, a good song with no money. Yeah, pa. Anyways, um, Dr. Dufour names his 2024 campaign team. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, let me just pass on the information. So there's a poster on page 11. It says the source is the Daily Post. Now, Dr. Dufour for president. Yao Boateng Jan, campaign coordinator. Enchi Boesiako Setre, director of operations. George Opariado, national youth coordinator. Naval Captain Kojo, retired um, security coordinator. This one will be very interesting for you. Dr. Kwabna Dufour Jr., fundraising strategist. Was he not the... Um, Unibank, yeah. Yes, Unibank MD. Yeah. I see. And he's the fundraising strategist. Yes. For the, for the campaign. Why not? Okay. Do you have a problem with that? I mean, clearly I do, but anyway. Well, the fact that he's, uh, he worked at the bank means that he, he knows how to go about raising funds. Yeah. Okay, Israel. Other members of this campaign team include Kofi Kukubo, Director of Communications, Jones Yao Entry, Director of Research, Solomon in Cancer, Deputy Director of something, because it's, it's, um, it's, it's rubbed out by the, the black spots in the newspaper. So this is Dr. Kwabna Dufour's um, campaign team as he runs for president 2024. Man, Manuesi, my okay. mouth has fallen. Let me bring you the Economy Times then. SOEs and JVCs record 3.716 billion losses, CDs, in losses in 2019. 2022 budget sent Ghana collates citizens' input for consideration. IEA calls, sorry, calls on BOG, IEA calls on BOG to cap lending rates. And then on page three, scrap price stabilization and recovery levy as fuel prices go up. COPEC demands. Can I say fight? Earth moving equipment to retract. Now, Parliament investigates roles played by SEC Yoko in men's gold closure. And uh, we also have Ghana card and digitization will improve SME access to financial support. That's a UMB CEO. And uncurbed power losses will lead to job losses. That's the energy minister saying that. We experienced hard times last year due to impasse with FDA. That's COA, um, that's the Center of Awareness, COA Research and Manufacturing Company. And Ecufando launches four aluminum development projects. That's all in the economy times. And yeah, that'll be, that'll be it for the economy times. Okay, so um, head to my journal online. My journal online. Yeah, okay, so can we have my journal online? dot com up please okay so whilst we wait for that let me just quickly scan to okay there we are right okay so um top story full list local government ministry releases mmdc nominations other stories um oh this is interesting carpenter gets five years for setting imprisonment for setting rivals room ablaze okay so former mp and regional minister ama benyuado has passed on may her soul rest in peace Baby mamas and side chicks are not entitled to deceased property. That's according to 
um, Sheila Minka Premer. Very interesting. I'm sure you want to read that if you're a side chick or a baby mama. Police deploy personnel to check disturbances following announcements of MMDCE's list. Wayak Education Minister to be called before Parliament of Awasi leakages, that's according to Nochukote. Um, photos, the second mini clinic of Joy News Habitat, Ecobank Hab uh, second mini clinic of Joy News Ecobank Habitat Fair ends. Gender dynamics of MMDC's appointees as 14.62 women percent women are nominated. So very, very, very low percentage of um, women nominated for the MMDCE position. Very, very, very low. I'm not sure about um, President Anado's commitment to the gender thing thing that he came and said in the beginning of his time as president, because obviously we're not seeing that playing out. Of course, we understand that the response be, oh, there were not a lot of women who came forward for the position or were interested or da 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 da. Yeah, okay. Still, 14.62% is pretty bad. 38 females and 222. In a country where there are more women than men, okay, 38 females and 222 males have been nominated for MMDCE's role. Hmm, yo. Okay, um, are there any other stories on my journal online? Can we scroll up, please, or, or down, or sideways? Or, okay, that's about it. Um, for myjoyonline.com, and that's about it for the news review. Yes. Okay, um, entertainment. Uh, I deserve three music awards, but I'll get rid of them. Okay, Shatawale, you're fit. Henry Quarte supports some adjective if you're part of his salary. Veteran actual kosher passes on. Um, there's a lot of business news, of course, um, sports, opinion. You can also watch live TV and radio on My Joy Online. Place you definitely want to be okay so that's it for the news review um israel do you want to just fill us in on what we'll be doing today? well yeah we'll be, to, we'll be talking a lot more about the mmdc's nominations and uh, the agitations that are going on. we'll be going around the country we'll be speaking with our correspondents to get to understand what the situation is in each of the regions the police is also talking about um you know dealing or deploying men to check the protests so that the people don't just run riot. Mm. So we'll be looking at all of that, but yes. And then we'll also be looking at Manasseh Azuria Wuni's uh, latest mm. investigative yeah. piece, The Bongo Scandal. Mm. Just need to stay on, we'll bring you all the details here on the AM show. Up next door, we're bringing you the sports, sports news. Yes. Stay tuned in. Hello, good morning and welcome to the AM Sports and it was a good weekend or it was a good weekend for the Phobians as two late goals from Kofi Koji and Salim Adams were enough as hassle of CI Kamsa in the preliminary round of the CAF Champions League. Did I not tell you? <laughs> I said, here's the man with a magic wand. Here's the man to change things. And he has absolutely done that. It is a crowd of folk getting this precious win at this precious time. Expertly taken, ball killed. Great, great. Poorly taken, and now some pressure now. Supporting, being released, and uh, you see a crowd of hook trying to find some space. Supporting here. So good back, and now you get a chance. Heart of folk with a chance, and they have made it too. And who is that? It is the 18 year old Salim, the new Ediviasi player who just joined the crowd. Heart of folk has scored what will be described as a spectacular goal there. Ha! 
And you would always get this man telling you that he's come to stay with the Krahata folk. It all started here. Poorly cleared by Capsule Club. But look at this one. The young man just hit it right. And so the man from Cote d'Ivoire says the continental club. Or Hata folk would be facing with that athletic at the Crossbow Stadium uh, on October 17th. And then the return leg would be in Morocco. But Ghana Premier League powerhouse Kumasi Asante Kotoko have announced Dr. Prosper Nateogum as the new head coach of the club ahead of the 2021-2022 Ghana football season. We have more for you in the following report. Prior to his new appointment, Dr. Ogum guided West African Football Academy, WAFA, to finish third in the 2020-2021 Ghana Premier League season. He will replace Mariano Barreto, who mutually terminated his contract with the Kumasi Base Club last week Friday. The 43-year-old manager joins the Porcupine Warriors in a two-year deal, having previously handled the UCC soccer team, Elmina Sharks, Ebusian Dwarfs and Karela United. He's also a sports psychologist and an educationist. Management and fans of Kotoko are hopeful their new coach will lead them to win the upcoming premiership title after narrowly losing the trophy to arch rivals Hatsu Folk last season. Hello, my name is Evans Mensa, and you can relive all the fun and excitement on Top Story, News Night, and of course, Ghana Connect via podcast. All you need to do is to log on to my Joy Online slash podcast. Set for your favorite show and relive the moment. Joy 99.7 FM, your Super radio for radio designing listeners. Joy 99.7. This is live. Live. Chama Ndikale. Chama Ndikale. Chama Ndikale. Chama Ndikale. Chama Ndikale. Chama Ndikale. What my course teaches me is that I should be consultative enough. I should involve people. I should not decide solutions for people. The people themselves must bring up the solutions. So for instance, if we are going to relocate a lorry station from here to the Tato Yili or the Kuko Market, I don't have to suggest to the people that this is the period that I have to relocate them. Myself, together with the assemblymen, will have to take such a decision, consulting the chiefs, the major political actors. And I think that I am not going to discount the influence and the impact of consulting the major political actors in the metro anytime such decisions are going to be taken. Because we need to carry people along. If you ignore, if you discriminate, if you are selective, in the way you consult people, it means you cannot get the support of everybody. And I would want to have the support of everybody. And I'm very confident that will be reflected in the confirmation that the Assembly The Rural Development Minister Dan Bochi, amidst armed security forces, the supporters chanted war songs marching on from the town center to burn at least six installations of the party in various locations in the township. 
From there, they violently proceeded to besiege the private residence of the constituency chairman in order to burn more of the party properties, but were overpowered by the police. This is life. Life. Chairman Nikale. Chairman Nikale. Chairman Nikale. Chairman Nikale. Chairman Nikale. Abdul Rahman Sharif, the party's regional deputy Nasara coordinator, who had been on an official assignment monitoring the situation since yesterday when tensions began to mount, said he was disappointed by the failure of the police to stop the incident despite the glaring signals. Uh, how many party pavilions have been touched? Okay, well, I can count three. Three, yes. I can count three for now. The central base, Patriotis base, and then uh, where our constituency chairman is sitting, yes, uh, a pavilion. Yes. But in the party office, do you have party office in Chirpone? We, we don't have a party office in Chirpone. It's just some pavilions that for the youth groups where people do sit. But we don't have a party office. Have there been any arrests here? No, so far we have not heard of any arrest. Have there been any injuries? No, I was told that the MP's brother was hurt, but I don't know how it is currently. I don't know, but the MP's brother, uh, they attacked him, the mob. You know his name, I sir? He has been taken to the hospital. You know his name, sir? He's Fatal. 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 So how did the police allow this to happen? Because yesterday there were signals and... In fact, this, even this morning, police, there were, were uh, police patrol and everything. We ourselves are wondering why that didn't happen. In fact, we ourselves, and going further, I think, I don't know if you interview some of them, let them understand that. Uh, if anyone is you, at least they should make some arrest and let them understand. Why well, if you don't make an arrest? They can do anything at any time and go scot free. All right, so as you've seen and heard in the videos that we've shared with you this morning on the AM show, there's been agitation in parts of the country over the release of the President's list of nominees for Metropolitan Municipal and District Chief Executives. There's have, uh, this have no new, except it's coming after the long delay in the appointments. And this is likely to further delay the confirmation of these MMDCs. So we're, there's also the issue of the gender balance of the 260 nominees. Uh, just about 40 of them are females, and then the rest, 200, more than 220 are, are males. Is it the case that the women are not available? Let's get on with our conversation. And having joining us now is Richard Richard Niyama, Executive Director of the Progressive People's Party. They have an angle, or they have a take on all of this. And then Frederick Ejakun Udru, who's a Dean Studies and Research at the Institute of Local Government Studies. And then Andrew Spediaku is an MC nominee for German South. He's a former administrator of the National Association of Local Authorities of Ghana. Thank you very much uh, to you all for joining. Let's start with Frederick, uh, who, Frederick Ejaku Odro, Dean Studies and Research Institute of Local Government Studies. So what do you make of all the agitations that we're seeing, especially coming after the long delay in the release of the list? We're thinking, or you'd think, that it will come with a lot more consensus than we're seeing right now. Well, um, let me state that it is very disappointing, the reaction, particularly the violent reactions we are receiving from across uh, some districts. The, this shows the lack of understanding of our democratic process. First and foremost, people are failing to understand what it means to live under rule of law. That in a system such as ours, if you have a disagreement, the way to go is not violent. Secondly, it shows gross uh, misunderstanding of the law. Because if you go into the law, the prerogative to appoint rests solely with the president. And if you disagree with the president about his choice, you don't go out 
and violently express it. You have to use other means to do that. And then if you also consider the fact that it's taking us a very long time, and notwithstanding whatever we may, we, we may say about the length of time it's taking us, this is, there was a le a le some level of novelty in that people were allowed to put in their application. And there was a long selection process. So if your candidate or the person you supported could not get through, the way to go is not through this violence. This cannot change anything. So this is pure case of lawlessness. And that sense of entitlement some people always have about the fact that it is either their choice or, or nobody's, notwithstanding what the legal processes allow. So this Mr. is Jacob, very condemnable. Mr. Jakodro, you say that this cannot change anything. I'm not sure, though, because a lot of the time the political leaders would tend to bow to pressure if uh, the agitations are strong enough. You see, uh, uh, any change that could occur would happen only if there are clear issues facts are deduced to show that a person appointed is not qualified or is not fit for the role. The fact that you go out on rampage will rather pre present you as uh, somebody who doesn't understand the process and that it is either your choice or nobody's. So I would be very shocked that anybody can uh, think that what they are doing can really change anything. The way to go, if I were any of these people, the way to go would have been to lobby the assembly members not to vote for the person so that there could be a chance for renomination. But if you go out this way and the assembly members, a majority of them, at least two thirds of them believe the person nominated is fit and they vote for that person, there is nothing you can do about it. You will go out today to uh, violently show, uh, show this, but after a day or two, you won't be on the street again. So I, I find this quite unnecessary. All right, let me bring in uh, MCA nominee for German South. He's uh, a, a form of okay, So we don't have uh, Andrews Bediakun uh, yet, but let me then bring in Richard Niyama, Executive Director of the Progressive People's Party. Now, your, your party has taken the position that you would have wished or you're still pushing for the election of uh, MMDCs. I'm sure all that's happening would uh, bolster your position that indeed this sh shouldn't have been the way we should have gone about it. Well, good morning, Israel. Yeah, good morning. And good morning, everyone. Uh, we have already wasted about nine months. That is almost a year in selecting or nominating MMDCs. And we are not, we have not finished yet. I can safely presume or project that we are going to sp spend the next six months seeing other drama, like what happened in Tremon, Tremon yesterday, on whether or not they should be accepted or rejected. We have seen all the fight and chaos that happens in the assembly after the president nominates. And this is not just about NPP. It is every government. You see, this past nine months that the president was trying to nominate people, if you know the intense lobbying that was happening at the presidency, you would realize that even that lobbying alone is not giving the presidency the needed focus to do the work it is supposed to do. We have MMDCs who are agents of development. We are wasting almost about two years nominating them before they come and settle into office and begin to work. And by the time they begin to work, then it is four years again. We have to go for general election and their time is over. Don't forget, because they are appointed, most of the time, by the time they arrive in the office, the presidency has already taken all the procurement decisions on their behalf. They will buy Wellington boots in Accra and deduct it from their budget. The assemblies cannot speak because if the chief executive speaks, the president has the power to disappoint him. And so we are entirely against this system, whereby the president sits in Accra 
nominate people to become district chief executives, and then there's chaos at the end of the day, and there's no development. Hence, our call and consistent push for, for the people to be given the chance to elect their own MMDCs on universal adult suffrage. Looking at the footage that is happening over there, these are things that are not new to us. They happen every now and then, and we're going to see more and more of it. And so we shall continue to say that without delay, Ghanaians should join our call to put a demand on the presidency, whether it is an NDC government or it's an MPP government or, or even a PPP government. Any president would enjoy the power of appointing and disappointing MMDCs. And so he will not willingly allow such a provision to be changed in the constitution. We were deceived about two years ago that uh, there was no consensus, and so we couldn't go for a referendum. But as a matter of fact, the provision that allows for the president to appoint or disappoint the MMDCs is not a provision that requires referendum. It is only Article 55, which bars political parties from participating in local assembly elections, which requires a referendum. And so if there's a political will for us to stop appointing MMDCs and get them elected, Parliament can change the, the, the appropriate provisions in Article 243 and so on and so forth. And we will be able to elect our own MMDCs. With this current situation, I can tell you that development at the local level is going to be very, very difficult because a lot of the contracts are awarded from Accra, procurement decisions are taken in Accra, the, the president is allowed to not only appoint the chief executive, but also appoint about 30% of the assembly members to go and dilute the powers of the elected uh, 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 assemblymen. Therefore, whatever the ruling government decides is final, and it happens. And, and it fools the winner takes all uh, 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 syndrome in the system. And so we, as a political party, when these things are happening, we are not surprised. And we shall always continue to advocate until Ghanaians understand and the political class accept that it's time for us to elect our own MMDCs. Let me bring in Mr. Odro. Mr. Odro, as uh, Richard Niyama has said, clearly the system where we have now is not working, is it? I, I do agree on that point that um, a lot more needs to be done. But I think it is over simplistic to think that just amending the constitution to elect MMDCs is the panacea to the challenge we have. There must be an overhaul of the local governance system of the country. And that includes whether we even need to make political parties agents for development. Look at the, the, the youth on the street thinking that they must fight for their own uh, man or woman to be made the chief executive. Why can't we harness the powers of the uh, uh, political parties to even lead the, the development agenda? And I think if you amend just a, one provision in the constitution without looking at the whole gamut of consequential amendments that might be made in even other legislations, you'll get it wrong. And again, let me emphasize, there is this per uh, wrong perception that uh, uh, um, procurement is made in Accra for MMDs. That is wholly not true. I mean, if you go to that, in our Public Procurement Act, there are clear guidelines for public procurement, even at the MMDA levels. There are entity tender committees. The, the, of course, the chief executive is the entity head in terms of procurement. So yes, there are discussions to be had relative to this, but it will be oversimplistic to think that just one amendment will be enough to solve the, um, the, the myriad of challenges we have in our local governance system. Yes, indeed, we've practiced this system for so many years. And let's remember our local government system, as we have it now, predates our, our constitution. The system has hardly changed, even coming into a constitutional rule. So there are challenges with it. That gives too much power to the executive relative to the control of the assemblies. And I, I also don't think it is fair to 
consider the attempt that was made prior to um, the, the referendum two years ago as cosmetic. Indeed, from us at the Institute of Local Government Studies, we did several research. I mean, we went out for public opinions as to how the system was running. There was no way um, with particularly the, the lack of support from the NDC. There was no way that process could have been carried we through. I believe if we can succeed in making the, the, the kind of ch changes, the reforms we need, we're going to need the political parties, the major political parties, particularly the MPP and the NDC to come on board to agree and help us go through that process. Without that, I can tell you, there is no chance in the world that we can have any meaningful reforms. And I think it, will, it is better to have holistic reforms than to have cosmetic ones that will not yield any results in our system. Let me bring in Andrew Zbediaku now. He's an MC nominee, German South, and he's a former administrator uh, when it comes to local government. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, uh, Mr. Bediaku. So, I'm, I'm sure, congratulations first of all to you for your nomination. Walk us through the, the processes to your nomination, to your selection. Um, uh, Israel, thank you very much. Um, I'll use the opportunity to thank the president and uh, my, my friends and you yourself. Uh, currently on my way to Kumasi, then proceed to Sumyane. Um, uh, to my my district or my municipal uh, assembly, as we we, we put it, and I think uh, Israel. Um, what I will say is that uh, Mr. Frederick Odro has said a lot about all these things, how people perceive the system, how the system runs, and all those kind of things. Are. The only solution to this issue that we are. Are comforted with currently is about the election of women disease that will end everything people have agitated and people have complained about why the president and the president has delayed and all those other so i sometimes ask myself the president wanted to give us this opportunity as Kenyans, let's go for elections of women disease but we said no because per the article 2431 is the opportunity for the president to appoint or nominate among these is subject to confirmation of the assemblies. But we, the president said, okay, let me give this thing to the people at the local level. But we said, no, we don't need it because of partisan politics. So all these areas that we are confronted with or the challenges we are confronted currently is as a result of we citizens rejecting the uh, this thing, uh, election of women disease. No, it, it, it's, a, it's a case, I believe it's a case where the president wanted us, wanted this to happen on his own terms. And the uh, Ghanaians decided that, no, they didn't want it on the president's terms. Actually, you see, if you look at um, the strategies that the president used, it's about consensus. And the consensus is built based on the, these strong two political parties that we have in Ghana. As Mr. Odu said. There is no way you can have a referendum in Ghana successfully without MPP and NDC on board. No political party can do that. So when NDC, all our engagement, because I was the uh, front runner within the, uh, the local government, Mr. Odo is aware about all this. When we started all these engagements and those things, NDC was on board. They supported it. I have a lot of evidence to show that NDC was in support of the election of women NDC based on the partisanship. Partisanship. So one of my engagements, I was living um, is that, uh, how do you call it? Kofodia to Ho. We had done all the engagements within the, uh, uh, across the country. So when we were leaving Kofodia to Ho, then all of a sudden we had information and the issue was addressed by honorable uh, the NDC national chairman to the effect that NDC should withdraw, and I said, "Wow!" All of a sudden, we couldn't make it. So, if we can progress as a nation, if we can go forward to have all these things resolved, as Israel will want his MC or uh, a DC elected, I think you people in the media, 
let us all engage. Let us all come back on board and see. That's the only way that we have we, we, we have now to resolve all this. President said, let me give the opportunity to the people. And I think we have to grab it. We have to take it. When we are able to take it as Ghanaians, definitely all these Hulabalus that people are complaining about will end. And I think that is the only way to go. Now, Fred, uh, Mr. Odro, so let's, let's look at what was presented to the people by the president and uh, analyze it and see how that will actually would have resolved the problems that we're dealing with. Because if you look at it, it's really about, it's still internal politicking because the people who are agitating, they believe that we belong to this party and we want a particular person to be nominated and yet we're, we're not getting that. And that is why they're agitating. Isn't that the case? Not, not, not quite. I believe that it begins. It, it is akin to the um, the competitive elect, uh, 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 democratic system we have, even internally with the, within parties. You expect that political parties will put up their own program of, of action if we want to call in manifesto, so be it, in the various districts. Then there will be systems in place to select candidates for the various political parties within every uh, district. Mind you, we 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 talking about this. I mean, there was this issue of winner takes all. We live in a country that a political party will lose in a district, and we have even losing candidates in parliamentary um, elections being brought back as um, uh, chief executives. But if you have gone through a process, a democratic process of selecting people from within the political parties, you will have situations that the internal democratic principles should work to ensure that the right candidates are chosen from each party. Again, let us indicate that the fact that we are talking about a partisan system, I believe in that system, doesn't mean that you, should, you can't have independent people who do not belong to any political parties also throwing their hats in, uh, in to contest for these roles. So that process by itself has got some inbuilt systems that will assuage the feelings of people. Of course, there are people who don't accept the rule of law. And some of these bullies will always insist that it is either my man or nobody else. Those people, I consider them deviants. We must have a system to deal with them because they would be breaking the law. The law says, let us select. If we go through the right processes to select, if you are not happy with it, you take the internal mechanism to resolve your challenge, or you even go to court to resolve your challenge. That is what pertains in a country of rule of law. I believe by going the partisan way also, we will have opportunities. Like, for instance, PPP may not even have a member of parliament. But it can have, uh, it can elect a, 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 a chief executive in, say, a Park Odisindium's district, KEA, for it to show in KEA that as a party, this is what we can do for this district. And we, you need to consider it elsewhere in other democracies. Take even the prime minister of the UK, Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson was once upon a time the mayor of London. And he used that to showcase his lead leadership abilities. You go to Turkey. The president of Turkey was once upon a time a mayor. All these people have used the local government system to build themselves, to show their leadership skills, to project to people their capabilities, out of which they can even ascend the highest office of the land. So we need to have a conversation. But my plea is that. We, are discuss, we should discuss this dispassionately. I sometimes get worried about the kind of language and insinuations used in our political discourse. That creates animosity, and it doesn't help us to devise systems that can really uh, help us to fashion out a, a governance system that can stand the test of time. From my perspective, the current system is not working. Let us really do an effective assessment of what we have. Whether in the last 30 years or so, our local government system has lived up to expectation. But let me quickly add before you take me off that 
It is not only about the election. That is one leg of uh, the decentralization process. There are a lot of other things we need to look at. What should the local government system be there for? What kind of funding arrangement are we putting in place for local government? What kind of accountability mechanisms exist at the local government? These are also other discussions we must have in addition to the democrat democratization of the system. So there is more to it than meets the eye. So we need a dispassionate conversation. And then as a people with a common destiny, we should decipher what will best work for us. That will be my take. Mr. Andres Bediako, let's stay with this issue of uh, partisanship. Mr. Ejaku Udro believes that, yes, we should go the partisan way. But if we, go, if we should go the partisan way, how different is it going to be from the current situation we have with the legislature where MPs are appointed or are elected based on, on partisanship? Is Andres Bediako? You have to unmute for us. Uh, uh, Israel. Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I think I, I will go with Mr. Odro's uh, assertion that uh, we have to go partisanship. That is the only way because when you ask people that uh, we don't need partisanship, then the question we always ask them: that What should be the criteria or the modus that we can use to have elections? As we have. Currently, let, let's no let's have people meeting. let's have people present themselves, even if you belong to a party, mm -hmm. present yourself mm -hmm. as an apolitical figure. Mm -hmm. Come, and uh, everybody else can, right. can contest. We will end up having about fifty. We would end up thousand people on the ballot. All right, we're having some challenges with uh, Andres Bediaku's connection. But uh, I'll, I'll, let me put that question to the PPE, uh, Richard Niyama. Mr. Niyama, so, so PPP, so here, here's the case where there's the push for partisanship. But as I was making the point, and uh, it, it's something that you actually support, that we shouldn't go partisan. Oh, are you saying that we should go partisan as everybody well else. israel we are in support of partisan all right but not immediately you see the the outcry against the referendum was the fact that our partisan nature of politics has not been something that the people like and so realizing that the people are not in support of partisanship we believe that we could go a step-by-step -step approach for example as i told you Article 243, which requires the president to, to uh, nominate district chief executives, is not an entrenched provision in the constitution. And that one can be amended by parliament when they go through the right procedures. And so we believe that we can go a step-by-step -step approach. And then after we have practiced uh, electing the MMDCs for, for, let's say, 10 years, 20 years, when the people feel that it is now time for us to, to allow the political parties to be involved, then we can go and allow the political parties to be involved. But let me just touch on something briefly that Mr. Frederick Udru mentioned about this, uh, whether or not it is a perception that government takes procurement decisions on behalf of MMDCs. I can cite a number of examples. And the most recent example that I remember is the fact that when NAPCO was introduced, a certain percentage of the budget for the MMDCs was deducted by central government to go and pay NAPCO without the consent of the MMDCs. But none of them were able to speak because if you speak, you are going to be disappointed. And so this is a clear example. It's not as if there's a perception. It is something that happens, and we see it happening every day. So back to your question, yes, PPP supports partisan uh, election of MMDCs, but not immediately. Immediately, we are demanding for election of MMDCs, and we believe that if the, the, the executive and parliament take steps to amend Article 243 to allow the people to elect the MMDCs on non-partisan basis for a start, they will see the benefits of election of MMDCs. And then later on, political parties can come on board to, to help it become better. But if we want to 
uh, use the political parties as a requirement before we, we go we go and elect MMBCs, then the people might might kick against it as it was happening two years ago, and then somebody will sit in a car and say there's no consensus. Therefore, I have cancelled the referendum. I wonder how he was able to arrive on that decision because I thought it was a referendum that would have determined whether there was consensus or not. All right. Let me come to Mr. Andrews Bediako now. So you have been nominated, and we know the processes that are supposed to follow. You have to be approved by your assembly. When is the process kick starting for you? Um, 10 days, within the 10 days uh, period. Immediately, the, the minister writes to the assembly, um, the first election should be within the 10 days, that uh, uh, current period that we are talking about, the 10 days. But Israel, let me tell you something. People are saying we should have elections of MNDCs, but not based on partisanship. I totally disagree with them. So when you ask them, what should be the vehicle? It's like, I mean, currently, as we have in our days, we know the district assembly elections, per how we are going to elect our uh, assembly members, should be non-partisanship. But nobody can convince me. When you get to the assembly, the first people that you confront with them, you ask the technicals at the assembly about who assembly member represents at the political party level. They will tell you this assembly member belongs to MPP, this assembly member belongs to NDC. But if we are just, uh, I mean, looking at this as, a, okay, let's go half elections, open it. Israel, I'm telling you, we can end up having about 50 people on the ballot paper. How can we run such an election? It will not be possible because everybody will be, saying, okay, I don't belong to this political party. At the end of the day, we are going to have these same political parties. Why is it that after assembly elections, people will come back and tell us, oh, MTC, we had about 2,000 assembly members. NDC, will say, we had about 4,000 assembly members. Where is it coming from? We are behaving, I mean, we don't know what is going on. We know nobody can convince me that if we want to go have elections at the assembly level or election of women DC, then we say it is nonpartisan. These two parties will come, and definitely they are going to determine whoever becomes the assembly uh, the uh, MC for that area. So why don't we open it? Let the political parties come on board. You see, I have attended some international conferences. When you go, then you tell people that this mayor represents the president in, let's say, Accra. They begin to ask why. People who learn from us in terms of local governance, they are ahead of us. Because if you look at the current situation, the administrative uh, decentralization, we have achieved it because we post people to the local governance structures and people are working there. When you talk of uh, financial, we have all this. But why is the political decentralization? That is where we are lacking. And I think nobody currently can convince me that we have we should have these elections, but it shouldn't be partisanship. It, it will never work. This same MPP and DC will come on board, I'm telling you, my brother. Mr. Bediako, how confident are you that you are going to cross the next hurdle, which is uh, get the approval of your assembly? Oh, uh, the way I'm going to... As we are speaking now, the calls coming, and people, even my presiding member, who is convener of this meeting, the, everybody, Nananum, everybody is calling me, congratulating me. And I know Israel... I'm not into that kind of partisanship, uh, as we call KNK MPP, KNK NDC. No, I'm not into that. I am a unifier, and I know definitely my people, all of them are calling me, all the assembly members are calling me. That I said, I, I'm on my way coming. So wait, I, am, I will be there with the, uh, uh, this evening. I will be there, and I will meet all of them. And I know Israel, I will go 100%. All right, so we will be watching this space to see how it pans out, but... Uh, I'm not sure if we're actually done with the uh, protests and agitations from across the country. But the other issue that is coming up has to do with the uh, rather, you know, low representation of women. Well, we have uh, 260 in all, and it looks like we're having just about 36 or 38 women. Yeah, uh, is that, it will interest you to know that this is the first time we are having such a number for women. This is the first time. So we will thank the president very much because I am an advocate for that. 
that let our women be part of the local governance structure as we have now. So we will thank the president very much for whatever it, he has shouldn't done. Shouldn't it have been a lot better than than this? Well, yeah, we can do better. But I think uh, I think that uh, the president has done well. So we shouldn't say as if uh, more women are not there. But uh, this is the first time, as I said, this is the first time that we are having the, this kind of women representation. And I think the president has done well. Let's all congratulate the president. Now, Richard Niyama, what do you make of the uh, rather low number of women? I think uh, a lot of women. But looking at our, our, the, the competitive nature of this uh, DC election or selection process and the lobbying that has to go on and so on and so forth, of course, it is predictable that uh, a lot more women who did not have political clout could not catch the eyes of the president. And so um, I, I think even though the numbers are, as uh, the German South uh, MC said, is higher than previously, I think much more could have been done. And I believe that um, if we put in place better structures to empower women, both socially and economically, they would be able to rise up to take some of these tasks. Richard Niyama is executive director of the Progressive People's Party and we've also been speaking with uh, Kwame Bediako, who is the nom MC nominee, Andrews Bediako, who's the MC nominee for Jamang South. He's a former administrator of uh, the National Association of Local Authorities of Ghana. You're still on the AM show. We have more coming up on the show. We have the ARB Apex Bank investigating how the Bongo District Assembly withdrew more than 180,000 CDs from the contractor's account without his approval. Manasseh Zuri Awuni, whose investigation led to the Apex Bank probe, reports that the Assembly used the contractor's company to award a contract to itself without the contractor's knowledge. We bring you the de intriguing details of the Bongo scandal, the latest investigative work by the fourth estate Manasseh Azuri Awuni. When the CEO of Apogan KA Enterprise, Asumbekre Karim Anabla, got a notification that 31,000 cities had been withdrawn in cash from his bank account, he was alarmed. But what alarmed him more was the name that came with the alert, David Aruk. David Aruk is the engineer and head of works department at the Bomo District Assembly, and Karim said, he had not permitted him to withdraw any money from his account. Roxen Akugre is the lawyer Karim contacted to officially seek answers from the bank and the district assembly. We got instructions from our client in the nature of uh, an award, a purportedly awarded contract to him. He's not aware that that contract has been awarded to him. He only got to know about it. But what prompted him to make inquiries was a text message he received on his phone um, indicating that some amount of money had been withdrawn from his account. His account, business account with uh, Maltaba Rural Bank in Bongo. So that alerted him to make inquiries. And he got to know that a contract was reportedly awarded to him to drill, construct, test, and uh, hand, hand, uh, do hand pump installation in some location unknown to him. And the district chief executive, Peter Imbisa, was a person who signed the letter awarding the contract to him. And the money was paid into the account without his knowledge and it was withdrawn without his knowledge. 
went to the Bongo Community Bank, Maltaba, and asked the manager. The manager told me that there were some contracts awarded to my company at Bongo Assembly. So they paid the money, and then they came and wrote the money. The Bongo Connecting Director called me, Samuel Akanyange, and pleaded me with me that uh, it was a mistake that they have used my documents. Then I told him that when you are using my documents, did you tell me anything? That's no. On June 14, 2021, an amount of 156,000 cities entered and disappeared from Karim's account at the Maltaba Community Bank in Bongo under murkier circumstances than the first withdrawal from the same bank. This time, Karim did not get a notification. He suspected the bank had intentionally deactivated the alert to him. The first one, I've got the transaction on my phone. But the second one, they disconnect me on the transaction. So I went and complained to them. And they told me there's a problem and then my number has deleted to their system. So I should give them the number to connect me again. So I gave them the number 26 June. So they connect me on the transaction 26 June again. The chairman and two members of the board of the bank told me a technical problem resulted in the deactivation of notification to Karim. When Karim requested a statement of accounts from the bank, it did not indicate who withdrew the money. The narration that went with the withdrawal of the 156,000 was miscellaneous debits. The DC of Bongo, Peter Ayimbesa Ayamga said, the assembly could not have gone to withdraw any money from the contractor's account. So I was surprised that they said that assembly went back and made same withdrawal. As I said, I'm not aware that assembly went back to make withdrawal. Assembly cannot go to make withdrawal because the project does not belong to assembly. The monies were paid in the names of the company. So how could assembly that is not the company go back to the bank to make withdrawals? In any case, assembly doesn't issue checks like previously. We pay through the GIFMIS platform. So when we pay, it goes to Bank of Ghana, and they do the transfer of same money to the, 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 the contractor's um, bank. And it went to the bank. So how could we go back into a different platform and make withdrawals of same? In the first place, we are not the contractors. Despite this assertion, his head of works, David Aruk, admitted he withdrew the first amount but claimed he did not know what he was doing. In fact, I, I don't even know how to start. They, they, I was called at the bank that uh, uh, we have good working relationship. This thing that uh, I should come. When I got there, Baba was sitting with the bank manager. So that's the intriguing story of the Bongo scandal. We're supposed to be joined by Manasseh Azura, who put it together. He's with the fourth estate. He hasn't joined us yet, but we will get him to join us and tell us more about his latest work, the Bongo scandal. We're taking a break here on the AM show to stay tuned in. We have more. All right, so we return to the Bongo scandal. Manasseh Azuri Awini has joined us now. Hello, Manasseh, and uh, thank you for making time to speak with us. So I'm, I'm curious, how did you come by the story, the Bongo scandal? Post on uh, a school in the Bongo district called Zoko SHS. And in that school, their structure, that's their dining hall structure, which was a temporary structure, collapsed. And so as we speak, they eat in the open. So if it is raining heavily, they cannot take their meals. So it was that Facebook post that made somebody draw my attention to the fact that the assembly played a role in the collapse of the structure, in a sense that the money needed to do the uh, project was not given. And so they did something that wasn't good enough and it was just luck that when the structure collapsed the students were not eating at the time we may have recorded deaths so in the course of that discussion the person drew my attention to another issue involving assembly in fact the there are a number of allegations of wrongdoing of that nature in the assembly 
So someone drew my attention to the fact that there was this contract and then the, the, the assembly awarded the contract to themselves. That's management of the assembly using a contractor's company without his consent, paying money and all of that. So it sounded unbelievable until I decided to delve into it. All right, and I'm sure once you got into it, you, you realized that uh, there was a lot more to the story. I'm curious, is it just the case of, uh, or is this happening just in Bongo or there may be other assemblies where this, these things were going on? Well, with the local government uh, system, the district chief executives and then the officials at the assembly do a lot of things. And if you look at the district uh, assemblies common fund uh, the audit report on the district assemblies common fund you find a number of infractions so when i did this story i had a number of calls from people from different assemblies who tell me well it is good we have gone to the assembly level it is an area that is often neglected but a lot of such rot goes on at that assembly uh, or at the assembly level uh, it may not be as brazen as this one, because this is the first time I have heard that the assembly actually awards a contract to itself, pays the money into the company whose account or the company that was used to do the contract and goes to redraw that money from the bank. I didn't know it was even possible to go and then do that. but. A lot of other things are happening, except that in this case, it sounded unbelievable until I was able to speak to all the parties involved. Yeah. How far with uh, the investigations, the ARB Apex Bank says it's, it's looking into it, how far? They have sent a team, I know of three officials from Accra here to Bongo, and they are speaking to the officials of the assembly the contractor whose company was used, and also the Maltaba Community Bank in Bungo. I have seen some statements they have taken from some of the people. For now, they said they wouldn't uh, go out and then uh, speak, but as time goes on, they would update us on what they are doing. So they've been there since last week, and I don't know whether they finished and uh, what they have found. I also heard that the Bank of Ghana was interested in the matter. And I'm hearing that some people are also planning to petition the special prosecutor and also shrug on the same matter. In all of this, was the project executed? Yes, I went to a number of the boreholes, at least three of them, and they had been executed. There was an allegation that, well, the project was executed because of the controversy that arose. The DC said, no, that isn't the case. The other thing is that the 10 other boreholes that were awarded genuinely, the DC withheld payment for those uh, boreholes and claimed that until this one, I mean the controversial one was resolved, money wasn't going to be paid for that one. But after this story, I'm told that some money has been released and then those boreholes will be drilled and completed. All right, thank you very much, uh, Manasseh Azura Wuni, for bringing us uh, up to speed with this uh, latest work, The Bongo Scandal. And The Bongo Scandal will be airing uh, right here on the Joy News channel. Uh, Manasseh, you give us details on that. Yes, I am told it will air this evening at 8.30 p.m. on the Joy News channel. All right. Thank you very much. So, yes, we will be bringing you the Bongo Skanda right here on the Joy News channel. Do stay tuned in. But thank you, Manasa, once again for, for the work that you're doing. And uh, Godspeed with uh, the other investigations that you're pursuing. You're still here on the AM show. Very interesting, intriguing story yes, where indeed. a contract is awarded on behalf of uh, a contractor. The monies are paid into his account and withdrawn mm. <laughs> without his knowledge. Fantastic, by all standards. <laughs> like, just. <laughs>
<laughs> there are some things that are just, you know, amazing. That's what, what movies are made of. But I'm sure it will be fantastic. And like Manasa said, it will be airing tonight. Yeah, and indeed, once um, it's happening, it's happened in one instance. It's likely that it's happening in a number of these assemblies. Mm. It's, it's something that uh, needs to be looked at. Yeah. It's, it shouldn't be possible for somebody's... For, money to be drawn from someone's account. The without their knowledge. Yeah, without yeah, their knowledge. No, it shouldn't be. Really shouldn't be possible. But anyway, I guess that's why we have the documentary to look forward to. Yeah. Airing tonight at 8.30 p.m. on Joy News. And but coming up next, we have an interview with the Africa Private Sector. So they're having a summit. There's a summit coming up um, in October. The Africa Private Sector Summit. It's running from the 19th to 22nd of October. So um, the team are joining us and we'll have a conversation about that and what we can look forward to with that summit. Also, we have um, showbiz news coming up a little, sh well, shortly, it's 8.25, so maybe in about 20 minutes um, with IB. So lots to do before we go. Don't go anywhere. This is still the AM show. When the CEO of Apogan KA Enterprise, Asunbekri Karim Anabla, got a notification that 31,000 cities had been withdrawn in cash from his bank account, he was alarmed. But what alarmed him more was the name that came with the alert, David Aruk. David Aruk is the engineer and head of works department at the Bomo District Assembly, and Karim said, he had not permitted him to withdraw any money from his account. Roxen Akugre is the lawyer Karim contacted to officially seek answers from the bank and the district assembly. We got instructions from our client in the nature of uh, an award, a purportedly awarded contract to him. He's not aware that that contract has been awarded to him. He only got to know about it. But what prompted him to make inquiries was a text message he received on his phone um, indicating that some amount of money had been withdrawn from his account, his account, business account with uh, Maltaba Rural Bank in Bongo. So that alerted him to make inquiries. And he got to know that a contract was reportedly awarded to him to drill, construct, test, and uh, hand, hand, uh, do hand pump installation in some location unknown to him. And the district chief executive, Peter Imbisa, was a person who signed the letter awarding the contract to him. And the money was paid into the account without his knowledge and it was withdrawn without his knowledge. Went to the Bongo Community Bank, Maltaba, and asked the manager. The manager told me that there were some contracts awarded to my company at Bongo Assembly. So they paid the money, and then they came and wrote the money. The Bongo Connecting Director called me, Samuel Akanyange, and paid me with me that uh, it was a mistake that they have used my documents. Then I told him that when you are using my documents, did you tell me anything? That's no. On June 14, 2021, an amount of 156,000 cities entered and disappeared from Karim's account at the Maltaba Community Bank in Bongo under murkier circumstances than the first withdrawal from the same bank. This time, Karim did not get a notification. He suspected the bank had intentionally deactivated the alert to him. The first one, I got the transaction on my phone. But the second one, they disconnect me on the transaction. So I went and complained to them. And they told me there's a problem and then my, my number has deleted to their system. So I should give them the number to connect me again. So I gave them the number 26 June. So they connect me on the transaction 26 June again. The chairman and two members of the board of the bank told me a technical problem resulted in the deactivation of notification to Karim. When Karim requested a statement of accounts from the bank, it did not indicate who withdrew the money. The narration that went with the withdrawal of the 156,000 was miscellaneous debits. The DC of Bongo, Peter Ayimbesa Ayamga said 
the assembly could not have gone to withdraw any money from the contractor's account. So I was surprised that they said that assembly went back and made same withdrawal. As I said, I'm not aware that assembly went back to make withdrawal. Assembly cannot go to make withdrawal because the project does not belong to assembly. The monies were paid in the names of the company. So how could assembly that is not the company go back to the bank to make withdrawals? In any case, assembly doesn't issue checks like previously. We pay through the GIFMIS platform. So when we pay, it goes to Bank of Ghana and they do the transfer of same money to the, 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 the contractor's um, bank. And it went to the bank. So how could we go back into the GIFMIS platform and make withdrawals of same? In the first place, we are not the contractors. Despite this assertion, his head of works, David Aruk, admitted he withdrew the first amount, but claimed he did not know what he was doing. In fact, I, I don't even know how to start. The, the, I was called at the bank that uh, uh, we have good working relationship. Listen, that uh, I should come. When I got there, Baba was sitting with the bank manager. And of course, that documentary airing tonight on a at, on Joy News at 8.30. Um, and so please do look forward to that. It should be really awesome. Awesome. Um, but let me, let me speak to my friends that have joined me in the studio from the Africa Private Sector Summit. Mr. Emmanuel K. Bensa is the Deputy, Di Deputy Executive Director, sorry, APN. Head of Media and Communications, APSS, and Mr. Nelson Godfrey Jim as the CEO, MSME Ghana Network, Secretary Coordinator or APSS of APSS Local Planning Organizing Committee. Okay, that's a lot of titles. So let me just let you introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Yeah, I'm Nelson Godfrey Dajiman. Okay. I'm a consultant by profession working in the private sector, mm. mostly with the MSMEs, okay. which constitute the informal sector. Okay. You know, and they are majority, 80, 90% of the economy and contributes significantly. Um, our entities also are a member of the Ghana Chamber of Commerce. Okay. We'll come to that. Okay. Um, the Ghana Chamber of Commerce is very significant mm -hmm. in the Africa private sector summit. Okay. You know, so that's why. That's it. And I'm the planning uh, committee secretary. Okay. And for also the, coordinator the... to see all the linking all the partners. And, okay. Oh, that sounds like a lot. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay, cool. Thank you. And Mr. Benza? Yes. So, so basically, by training, I'm more of a regional integration person, ECOWAS and AU policy analyst. But for the African, uh, the African Continental Free Trade Area Policy Network, that's, that's kind of the day job uh, where I'm responsible for outreach uh, and then uh, looking at AU policies and so on. But uh, for Africa Private Sector Summit, it's because it's bringing a, a number of organizing partners. So I had the media and communication to ensure that we, we reach out to the media to make sure that we get the messaging because okay. the messaging of everything is important. It's important, of course. So, and uh, uh, Nelson has been very critical in the mm. conversation on, on, on ensuring that, you know, he, he, he opens many avenues to okay. get the outreach out. Of yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So what is the purpose of this summit in the first place? Okay. So, so basically, um, we've all heard a lot about the African continental free trade area. Of course. There are many layers, many different conversations happening. For some, it's about women and youth. Mm -hmm. For some, it's about uh, the private sector. Uh, and in fact, the private sector and after, the conversation around that has been overflogged for some of us. Uh, because a lot of the time, it's just about meetings and conversations around the private sector. How do we open it up for them? And so on. Now, the difference with the African Private Sector Summit is that we are, more, even as we position ourselves as a think tank, we are also more uh, uh, to do. Uh, a, a do tank, <laughs> a do tank, okay, a do tank. <laughs> so to speak, in the sense that we want action oriented results in the context of the conversation around after, which means that we want to see specific things mm. that have been achieved. Okay. One of them is ensuring that the private sector is empowered. All over the world, we know that the private sector has, has, you know, has been experiencing challenges, and COVID 19 has not helped at yeah. all. A lot of businesses have collapsed and so on. but now is the time with what we have seen 
with people making lemonade out of lemons, lemons. around mm -hmm. COVID, what we need to do is to make sure that the private sector really gets the, the necessary boost mm. to make sure that it is also contributing, okay. it's taking advantage of the African okay. continent of free trade area. So it is in this context that the African Private Sector Summit felt, look, well, what do we need to do practically to empower the private sector? We need action-oriented things. Mm. Hence the draft Bill of Rights, which is okay. now with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. That was one of the major outputs okay. of our maiden edition in March. Uh, we, we managed to get the European Union and the ECA to find money to put up a Bill of Rights. So now it's with the uh, lawyers. Uh, the lawyers are the ones who were asked to apply. So the draft Bill of Rights for private sector is supposed to be uh, applicable for all 55 member states of the AU uh, so that it will help regulate how the private sector works, help empower them. But the other interesting and important conversation for APSS is uh, private sector working together with academia. Mm. Because at the end of the day, private sector was built by, you know, uh, academia. The, ac yeah. uh, the academics have been shunned for too long. Mm -hmm. So the partnership with organizations like the Association of African Universities, yeah. which is right here in Accra, by mm -hmm. the way, they've been around since 67. Okay. They used to be in Morocco, then they moved to Accra. Moved, yeah, okay. They're at East Legon. So the Association of African Universities is also an AU agency, but it's the apex AU agency responsible for promoting the uh, 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 education and implementing the educational policies of the African Union. Okay. And so the Association of African Universities, because it's 55 member states of the African Union linking up as, as an association of universities, they're a powerful force to deal with. So yeah. they need to work together with the private sector, look at how they restructure the curriculum to ensure that the up and coming generation also begin to appreciate mm. how the African Union works how regional economic communities like ECOWAS, SADC, and all these things work, plus also how uh, the African continental free trade area also works. AFTA is an opportunity for us to do things differently. Yeah. So we need to empower the private sector, mm. need to empower our academics as well to make sure that, so to that end, there's even going to be a trust fund. One of the outcomes, outputs of this uh, second series in October is that there will be an, a trust fund to ensure that some money is put in by chambers of commerce into the trust fund to, and part of that money will be used to help empower academia across the continent, okay. to help restructure their curricula as well, okay. and ensure that you know, they do the needful to make sure that uh, the AFTA becomes a meaningful thing and not just another project by the AU mm. where you know it's just talk about talk and talk uh, and no, talk no no and no talk no 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 we are action oriented so it's it's in that re respect that uh yeah okay so yeah, you yeah. mentioned you have mentioned some of your partners yeah. um but who are some of the other ones yeah. and what what roles are they playing um, yeah. you know in order um, to actually, yeah okay. um yeah. actually is a, a multi-stakeholder partnership mm. uh the Ghana Chamber of Commerce and Industry the Pan-African uh, Commerce uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry, as he, uh, Ike has said, mm -hmm. also the African Association of African Universities, um, their own think tank, which is an after policy network, yeah. APN. Yeah. Um, the CSOs, the CSOs are there, Chamber business and trade unions, yeah. chambers of commerce, and also um, the MSMEs, as I, I have mentioned, are all partners, okay. and as uh, mentioned by Ike also, okay. funded by the uh, UN um, Economic Commission, Commission for Africa. Africa. Yes. Okay. Okay. UNECA headquartered in Ethiopia, okay. and then the EU. Okay. You know, but we're also looking for extra partners because the interest yeah. is growing, and the participants now, which are targeted at, at 200, um, is a hybrid. So the face to face 200 in Accra, but globally, the first one in March had about 6,000 online participants. Wow. Okay. Yes, that was great. That was great. So yeah. now 200 uh, face to face um, uh, participants. And then but, the rest will be online. Yeah, o online. Okay. And, um, you know, the interest is growing. Yeah. Uh, so we need to uh, see that we get other partners involved and uh, even corporate sponsorship. Okay. Uh, so okay. those corporate entities that want to associate with this. Uh, this is key. Okay. You know. All right. Good stuff. Um, let me come back to you. Okay. So you talk about the fact that um, um, one of the outcomes that you're hoping for, that you're planning on, is the setting up of the trust fund. Yes. Okay. So that's one thing. What are some of the other um, outcomes or 
achievements that you are hoping that this summit will be able to materialize? Well, the idea is that we're building on the success of Series 1. Mm. And we know that a lot of people may not have followed Series 1. So we want to continue reminding them about the, the, the rationale in the first place of Series 1. So, so to that end, I think for some of us in the media and communications, there's still a little bit of work for us to do because we need to ensure that in the 120-page report that came out, there's one on the website which can be mm -hmm. downloaded from africaprivatesectorsummit.org. Uh, it needs to be clear, um, for the five days of that summit, there were a lot of very interesting speakers, okay. including people like uh, former trade, uh, Minister of Trade, Bill Garber. He was also part of the panelists, I believe, on day three. But we had, a, uh, and then we had uh, the president of Niger uh, as a keynote speaker because of where Niger is in the conversation on AFTA. They are the champion for the African, AU champion for African continental free trade area. So we, for, for, for those of us at communications, we, what we want to do going forward ahead of the summit is to be able to distill some of the messaging from the five days held in March mm. so that it is clear on day one, these are the outcomes that were held for day one, day two, day three, and so on and so forth. And then use that to build the momentum for series two on, in, in October. Okay. So that there's a bigger and uh, larger conversation. Now the conversation on this one is uh, a lot more focused on the regional economic communities, the African continental free trade area, bringing former presidents as well okay. to the table. So if we should have to people like Dangote, and millionaires across the continent who can come and tell us that story, their, their story. You see, a lot of the time, spending time with someone who has been on the ground, who has made his millions for 30 minutes will give you a lot of insight into how things can be done. Mm. It's not always about just giving you money mm. to do something. Of course. It's the experience, telling us how you did it, uh, what inspiration you can give us so what that we can... What it takes, what you must do, what you mustn't do. Precisely. Yeah, and in course. this age where some of us believe that the youth is a superpower, probably the fifth superpower mm. in what it's been able to do in Mali and all these other places yeah. and Guinea, it is important that we also get the buy-in of the youth to okay. appreciate uh, why this summit is being held. So to that end, we, we actually have a young man from uh, uh, Gambia as well who has been doing some good things. Okay. Uh, on the uh, in, in his country, okay. so he's going to be hopefully coming to to, to this summit to, to tell us, what, as an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur, what 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 has he been able to do okay. to help inspire the youth, and also link that conversation up with what millionaires on the continent have been able to do, okay. their experiences as well. Now, yeah, a lot of the time there's so many conferences like these. So the question is, what is the unique selling proposition that we want For to bring this, to bear exactly. on this? Yeah. The added value, what is the added value? The added value, uh, I think, for us, the, the, the biggest takeaways, and Nelson will build on this, is that we want people to understand that the private sector needs to work with academia, number one. Mm. We need to have a trust fund for uh, the, the educational institutions. Yes. The educational system needs an overhaul. A, an overhaul. <laughs> Reason for which we see youth all over the place, stumbling over each other because they want to get a job. Yeah. They want to get a job when they can stay at home, become entrepreneurs. You know, there's no, we, we, we can't rely on office jobs any longer, especially with what we have seen with COVID. Yeah. <laughs> COVID has forced us to stay at home. Yeah, exactly. We can't be staying at home watching paint dry. No, you can't. We need to go out on the farm and all these things to see what we can do yeah. to, you know, make a little bit of money and save our parents from, you know, <laughs> from heartaches yeah, as well, yeah, yeah, yeah. from looking after us. So all these things are some of the reasons why we are motivated as a team to ensure that we, we pull off a, a, a great summit. We are very happy that we have supporters like the UN Economic Commission for Africa supporting. It didn't come easy. It, it, it took the leadership of the chair, uh, Mr. Wendell, and his organizing committee to make sure that the ECA bought into the idea. It's not every day that the ECA will look at your concept paper and say, we like it, we'll put money behind it. So the fact that they are willing, in just in six months, they have put money behind it and willing to sponsor so many participants, 150 participants, no and problem. then flying in journalists mm. to pay their accommodation, tells us that we're on, on to a good thing. So we're happy that uh, we have the support of the ECA, parts of the EU as well, okay. uh, and, and all these other, we, we hope to grow our partners so that we can continue the momentum 
up to Rwanda. In Rwanda, Series 3 will be held in Rwanda, okay. first quarter, and we'll be doing more uh, outputs as well. By okay. then, we, we would have clarity on where the state, the, the educational trust fund is, 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 is going, as well as uh, some of the other things on the relationship between Association of African Universities as the Apex AU Agency on Education and the uh, Pan-African Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Okay. The other output of the maiden edition was that we brought them together to sign an MOU to ensure that implementation of some of these things happens very quickly, okay. uh, rather than uh, talking and talking up and down. You know, so more outputs are going to come out from this. For me, as a media and communications head, one of the things that I'm doing also is uh, setting up a media network for this conference. So that we bring the media, both local and international, to make sure they carry the messaging. Also offer them some training on what the AU Regional Economic Communities AFTA is about. Because okay. there's a lot of things that are, are headaches in Ghana. And sometimes we may not have enough time to, to okay. read up about AU and ECOWAS okay. and all these other institutions. So we want to be able to do that as well. And it hopefully helps take some of them to Rwanda and wherever else uh, well. the series, other series of the okay. APSS takes us. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, and just before you go, um, if you can just give us a brief idea of how this is going to impact or affect or benefit the private sector here in Ghana. Like, what are some of the things that we can... Uh, actually, the, the uniqueness of this summit is that it's not the usual talk shop. Okay. It's an action-oriented, uh, implementable summit in the sense that even the Series 2 now, mm. in the uh, end of October, is aimed at an, a, a, a master action plan which will be contributed to by the various sectors okay. in terms of projects and programs that will be implemented from October. Okay. So immediately after the summit, the projects are going to be implemented. Okay. One of the projects, for example, is that the chambers will partner with the financial sector, mm. including uh, the central banks. And so uh, the Ghana Central Bank is needed. Uh, John Awa of the Banking mm -hmm. Association, all of them are needed. Uh, to talk with the private sector to solve this nagging problem of uh, access to ease of access to finance, okay. right? And we have a solution. Mm. We have a solution that will emerge in the in the summit for the players to work together to get ease of access of finance and also um, the interest rates and things like that related, okay. right? And then he had talked about um, the partnership between the private sector and the universities. But it also involves the private-public partnership because actually um, precedents are expected to sit round with the business magnets, right? And even the youth entrepreneurs that he has mentioned, a lot of them are coming from around the country to participate. And we are uh, hoping our president will host this mm. because uh, it is his country that uh, this is happening. So if his other colleagues are expected to come, then he becomes the host mm. and uh, possibly invites all of them, plus also the magnates uh, to yeah. come and have what we call the big conversation. Okay. The team is awakening uh, the sleeping giants of Africa mm. to get the Africa we want yeah. and to get Africa's turn around. Africa itself is a sleeping giant. And there are various sectors of Africa, including our peoples, who are sleeping, mm. who need to be awakened. Awakened, yeah. You know, to implement the various protocols of the Regional Economic Commission and also after. So okay. we need all hands on deck. On, yeah. Right? And we are even bringing a big contingent of women entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs, uh, MSMEs from across the country and the continent, including young guys who are not waiting to get a job, but mm. after university have entered into farming, some into digital and technology things, you know, and they are all coming to this all summit coming. and then they it will benefit sounds, from it. It sounds really good. So um, if somebody is watching us and they want to participate, just before we go, how do they get involved? Yeah, um, they go on the website. Yes, Africa also, Private we have Sector Summit.org. Okay. 
uh, what they can also do, with the, the website is still being populated with information. Okay. Uh, but once they send uh, an email to the to the emails indicated on the website, they'll be contacted. Yeah, we'll be con we'll contact them, and then up until we we sort out some of the technical issues around the registration. If if we should for, give a number, maybe we can. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. So okay. they can they can call zero two four one triple eight one six seven zero two four one. Triple eight one six seven, and then they will get some information and materials and all that. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much it's a pleasure. Um, for joining us this morning. We're looking forward to from the 19th to the 22nd of October. And of course, you can call the number or you can go to the website if you'd like to sign up for this amazing conference. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, once again. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, so um, we only have about 10 minutes left on our clock. And for the show, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, well, who knows what we'll come back with. Don't go anywhere. Oh. All right, so there's more uh, coming up on the AM show. Well, the final thing we're going to be talking about, uh, join you, sis. Head of the health desk has uh, Fred picked Smith. up. Yeah, Fred Smith. He's picked up an award, and uh, will be. He's been recognised for his coverage of the COVID nineteen outbreak and all the work that he has put in since the pandemic began. It's a humanitarian global uh, humanitarian Glo awards global, and this happened on Saturday. And Fred is joining us to tell us more about it. Hello, Fred. Hi, Izzy and Enimwa. Cong Hi, Fredible, Credible, Edible. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Enimwa and Izzy. Okay, yeah, and uh, we're all aware that you have put in quite a bit of work as far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned. Yeah. So it is well deserved. Um, and I think yeah. you there should be more awards coming your way. But tell, tell us more about this award. Well, the Global Humanitarian Awards Global uh, they seek to recognize individuals who have helped in impacting humanity in some way. And uh, this particular award focused on the coverage of COVID-19. And so uh, I was nominated from the media side to have helped in first educating the public, bringing information that has been crucial in saving people uh, at a time when many are dying around the world. All right. So uh, now what does it come with? Uh, do you have to take a trip or what's it going to be for you? <laughs> no, there, there's not going to be any trip for me. It's uh, simply um, a recognition. Uh, an award of recognition for me uh, okay. for the work I've done since the start of the pandemic uh, to date. So uh, mainly that. All right. Who are the other people who were awarded on the or recognized on the night? So NGOs, doctors who've been working in the area of COVID prevention, um, uh, people who are working in ministry who have helped others in some way. You recall at the time you went on lockdown in Accra and uh, Ashanti areas. Uh, the major concern then was that people were not going to be able to find food to eat. So we had people from uh, the ministry coming in to uh, support such persons, and they were recognized for this role. There were those who took some persons who could not afford their homes and were evicted as a result of their inability to work or raise money to pay for their rent. They were also recognized, and, and we, we also had a number of doctors, uh, persons who helped to bring information from the point of view of medical professionals also being honored. And we had uh, the, someone also being on, on it from the KCCR, Kumasi Center for uh, Collaborative uh, Research. All right, Fred, uh, you've done incredible work. And so we're going to, we're also going to recognize you here on the show. We're going to play a song for you. So you have to tell us which song you want. Wait, before that, and tomorrow's Banku at Uncle and Auntie Jane is on me, Fred. So oh, that's. Wow. Is that all you're giving him? 
It is not about the 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 value. The, the, it's about my heart. Do you understand? No, you don't. Fred understands. He okay, knows Fred. what is. Fred, which song would you want us to play for you? Um, is it? I think since you are honoring me, uh, it will be good if you choose for me. <laughs> oh. Yes. I can't even make up his no, mind. He's what saying, songs should you know, I, I he's saying play for that, him. you know, I'm feeling, thinking of some Shata Wale, you know. I, I, just, I just want to make it easy for you because uh, I'm, I doubt if you have the song I love. Ah. Readily available. Try what me. What song is it, La? Okay. Hey, Fred. Uh, anything from Nora Jones. Oh, I love Nora uh, Jones. Nora, Nora Jones, yes. So. Which one? Uh, this one called. Um, a million bicycles in Beijing. Oh, also. there's a million bicycles in Beijing. She has this weird, you know, vibe-ish kind of. But right. Fred, it's not a, it's okay. We'll play Shatawale for you. <laughs> it's not a, a nine o'clock in the morning. So you see why we call you edible, fredible. Yeah, there's music that you want to play. I'm a place of romantic. I know my level. Thank you. I've decided. End of conversation. <laughs> anyway, Fred, before you go, what's the latest uh, with our COVID situation? Well, um, we our situation seems to be improving. The number of new cases uh, also improving. We're not recording as many cases as yet, but we're still not out of the woods. Uh, you can see on your screens the 256 new cases. Uh, but uh, if you check about a month, also, a few weeks ago, we were recording cases in excess of 500 and 600 uh, per day, and that was of serious concern for us. And also, the number of persons who are having severe COVID is also uh, going down per the data uh, released by the Ghana Health Service. And that is, I, I think, is good news for us. What we need to do to consolidate the gains we've made is to uh, continue to observe the protocols, wear the mask, uh, use the hand sanitizer. And I observe in town many, uh, many organizations have stopped putting bus uh, buckets with the water in front of their their offices. Uh, I think we need to go back to it. We need to ensure. I mean, uh, we we need to give in give give in all our fuel so that we're able to completely. Uh, bring down COVID-19. Uh, in Ghana, we've not vaccinated as many as we had wished to. We targeted 20 million. We are not at 2 million yet. And we have a very long way to go. Uh, vaccines are not readily available uh, that much. And so uh, we need to take personal responsibility and avoid the things that will help spread the virus. All right. Spoken like a true ambassador, Fred uh, Smith, speaking about our COVID-19 situation. So congratulations to you once again, Fred Smith.